Testing, testing. Hi, it's Stefano from uh, Vox Podcast and here together with me, my co-host Diane Ha, uh, connecting from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, we have the pleasure and the honor to have our guest, uh, Dennis Kaiser from Forecast. Very interesting uh, startup based in uh, Copenhagen and uh, London. Um, Dennis will be giving us some information. Diane, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I let you uh, introducing uh, Dennis and forecast, uh, and then we hand it over to Dennis to continue uh, answering our questions. Sure, yeah. So uh, forecast, I think, is, is actually quite an interesting business. I've been in the SaaS um, software space myself. So uh, first question for you, um, Dennis, basically just want to hear the story behind forecast um, and how it started. Sure. Uh, so um, forecast was started uh, approximately three years ago. Um, actually, uh, you know, to some degree, spinning out a little bit of, of uh, previous work in, in consulting. So uh, me and my co-founders um, have all worked in, in consulting uh, before starting this company, uh, and we, we ran our own uh, consulting company uh, previously, uh, and, and basically picked up a lot of uh, problematic areas for, for a lot of, of our customers and, and customers' customers. And, and, you know, at some point thought that we had to do something about it. So uh, that's basically, basically what we did. Basically, you, you found a bunch of problems. You were trying to solve the problems. Yeah, that's it. Um, so that's so it. Basically what we're, we're trying to do, if, if I should tell a little bit about that, is, is um, you have it in the media all the time, right? Uh, projects are delayed, especially public projects, right? Uh, people don't really know what to work on. They get more expensive than you plan, all this stuff, right? So it's, uh, in a sense, a classical problem we're trying to solve. Um, but we uh, are taking a, a radically new approach to, to solving this problem compared to, to, I'll say, everyone else in the market, at least as far as I know. Um, and, and basically what we do is we, we leverage all the data that a, a company has already in place in, in whatever systems they use. Uh, and then we actually use um, AI and machine learning technology to mine that data and understand meaning of that data. And, and by doing that, helping people uh, basically improve the way they manage the workforce, the way they, the way they manage their work, uh, the ability to you know, project how profitable they will be on different types of work. Um, so a lot of kind of around delivery and, and operations of, of an organization and how to make that efficient. Thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, Dennis, I read you... We'll come back to that in a bit. Yeah, I read you, you raised uh, $10 million to date. I, I would say that generally when you talk to me, uh, talk the way you will talk to um, someone in interested in investment uh, market. Um, when you talk to Diane, uh, probably more about operation and technology. Um, I'm very interested to find out how did you um, raise $10 million and uh, what type of investors you have on board? Sure. Uh, so uh, basically, we, we started building the product uh, when we ran the, the consulting company. Uh, and, and after kind of building that, uh, we managed to get some customers on, on the product. Um, and, and, you know, at that point, it felt like we should not do consulting, we should do software uh, instead. Um, so basically, you know, taking the prototype we had at that point and then the, uh, the, the list of customers, I think there was like around 20, um, we went and, and talked to some VCs, uh, basically to, to figure out if it was possible to raise some money and, and, uh, you know, focus entirely on this instead of kind of having to run two businesses at the same time, basically. Um, so we approached some investors, uh, through some, some personal network and, just in general, like reaching out to investors like cold, basically, um, and ended up getting, uh, I think, f three or four, basically, term sheets and proposals from from investors because they really liked the idea. They thought the the vision we had for the future was was you know was cool and and, and in in a you know a plausible direction. So it's you know, I think it's a balance of uh, of of presenting something that's you know realistic, but at the same time really on the forefront of technology and, and what what technology will look like in in you know in X amount of years. Um, so we ended up uh, taking an investment at that time from a, a Danish fund, the biggest fund here in Denmark, actually called Seed Capital, um, and and then we, you know, closed down the consulting business, started running uh, the software business, and and took the prototype we had and basically rebuilt that from scratch, um, and then you know hitting some milestones, then you you know show the investors you're successful, and then basically going on to to raise the next round. 
Um, so again, you know, we reached out to through our network, and you know, we had a lot of incoming investors also because they had kind of heard from from others in the market that we were building something that that was really cool and that, that people really liked. Um, and again, ended up with with a few proposals and, and ended up going with a, a another fund called Hardcore uh, Capital. Um, so raised some money from them, and then uh, again agreed to some milestones we had to achieve. And then after achieving those milestones, um, went out and, and raised some more money. Uh, so uh, that was basically our latest round, which we did in, I think like September last year or so, uh, where we, uh, for kind of the first time, went outside of, of Denmark and, and tried to raise money internationally. And we, we raised money from a, a, a British fund or an English fund uh, called Crane. Uh, which is a fund that specializes in AI, big data, uh, B2B SaaS uh, software, right? So a very specialized fund, but you know, very, very, you know, perfect fit for us in, in the type of space we're in and, and, and the product we're building. Um, super experienced guys. Uh, we're really happy with, with the investors we have. All, all three of them are, are super great in, in providing different types of, of information and knowledge to kind of help boost the business. Um, so I, I think that's kind of that's kind of where we are now. So now we're at a state where we're, you know, again trying to, as usual, trying to prove some new milestones that we need to, to achieve. And then once we do that, we will we'll probably go and raise uh, another round. All right. So uh, sounds like seeds done. Series A was done as well. Uh, we've chosen not to name it because you know it's uh, it's <laughs> difficult to figure out exactly how much cash you need to to really big a, a global, you know, market leader. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, um, now I wanna switch back to a bit of the tech um, mm -hmm. and, you know, hear more, more about it because I know it's an award-winning tech, all sorts of awards, Captera, G2 Crowd, Software World, et cetera. Um, and um, the spin on it as well with AI to make project management easy basically you don't need a pmp or prince 2 anymore you know um and you can still manage projects uh you know with skill and really efficient so can you tell us a bit about your your tech and uh what your competitive advantage is especially since there's so many other project management tools out there currently yep. um yeah so i think I, that's a, a classical question i get um it's uh I think when you look from the outside into into the space that we're in it it can look quite crowded uh, but I'll say the bulk of competitors are um, typically focused on the, on the smaller teams and more like the collaboration space, uh, which is not really where we are. We're focusing uh, a little bit high on the market. So we're focusing more on companies that are, you know, I'll say 50 people, you know, 50 employees and upwards, right? Um, so basically uh, the, the, point, the point in time where a lot of these kind of single purpose collaboration tools, they start breaking. Uh, you need to have a better understanding of, you know, your workforce, you know, what are you delivering in the future, understanding your pipeline of work, uh, understanding your pipeline of financials. Um, so, so I think that's a clear differentiator. And a second thing is that we really try to work hard on building uh, very, very strong connectors to other third party systems. So that means if you take a look at the competitive space, most of the competitors will, will come with an approach where they say, all right, you buy our product, you need to replace X, Y, and C uh, in your organization. Um, we don't do that. We come and, and, and basically say to you, all right, you can work with our product in conjunction with whatever you have, uh, which drastically lowers the, the barrier for, for adoption for the customer side right? because they don't have to replace a bunch of systems. Uh, and then second of all, it gives the advantage that we can actually uh, now, uh, by connecting to this data, we can actually get a large amount of historical data out of the customer, right? Uh, which works to that benefit in the sense that we can then take their historical data mine that using AI and machine learning, and then basically give them insights immediately on, you know, what went wrong in the past, right? And use that to project uh, future success for them. Um, so I think that's a vastly different approach. Uh, and that's only, you know, technologically possible because, you know, we've founded the company basically as a, a, as a data science AI first or, or um, AI and API first company. Um, so that basically means we, you know, from the ground up, when we started building it, we wanted to connect into third-party systems, right? That was a big thing for us because we knew that to make the AI work, we had to have access to data. Um, so that's a key differentiator, right? And, and we're seeing customers that are saving anywhere from like 10 to 50% of the time they were spending before 
with manual processes uh, that they're now you know completely removed and that's basically been automated, right? So we try to kind of automate all these these tasks around the work that's too, typically really boring, right? So you know if you're a project manager, most of your work will be in a spreadsheet or you know trying to kind of massage some data. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean you could argue it's not really super valuable, right? Because you're paying these these uh, these people probably a fairly high rate, uh, you know, salary, right? And and if you could automate a lot of those processes, they could actually focus on stuff that's also more fun for them, right? Which is you know, focusing on the team, focusing on the customers, you know, spend more time understanding the customer, their problems, what they need to do. Um, so from that perspective, I think it's it's a drastically different approach. Um, even though coming from the outside, yeah, it, it can look a little bit crowded. Dennis, uh, I hear you keep saying we, uh, and so. Uh, probably you're speaking on behalf of your team. Would you mind to spend a few minutes talking about who is in your team and uh, maybe a few words about the founders? Sure, um, so, so the founding team, we are four people. Um, actually, uh, all, all, uh, all of us have studied together, uh, studying computer science uh, here, you know, now, now it's, it's a few years ago, but you know, um, so that was, that was kind of the core of, of why we started. Um, and uh, the team right now is around 50 people. Uh, so spread across our two offices. We have an office in Copenhagen where we started, uh, where I'm at right now. Uh, and then we have an office in London uh, that we just opened uh, about a month ago. Uh, so that's fairly new and we're ramping people there. So uh, for now, I think there's around five people there, but we're ramping to be about 25 uh, very soon. Uh, so quite rapid ramp. Um, we're adding about, uh, I'll say one to five people to the, uh, to the team uh, on a monthly basis right now. Um, so, you know, quite aggressive scaling, um, which is also interesting, you know, uh, I see a lot of companies, especially in these times with, with this whole uh, C19, uh, that are kind of scaling back and we're kind of doing the opposite, trying to, to scale up uh, because we're not really, luckily we're not really seeing a, a big slowdown in, in, in business for us because we're building a core system that you need, right? So no matter kind of, no matter what the global situation is, you still need something to help you do this, right? And if we can help you improve cost and improve operations, then it's uh, a win-win no matter kind of where you are. That's brilliant. Thanks, Dennis. We'll come back to uh, C19 effects uh, a little bit later. Um, I wanted to follow up on um, what you responded earlier to in relations to the tech. Um, so the unique thing about your tech is basically you've designed it in such a way that it um, can integrate with a bunch of, that's super flexible integration wise. Um, yeah. And I mean, that's, that's basically the key to get AI to work. You basically need a bunch of historical data for you know, machine learning and whatnot for it to be useful and successful. Um, can you talk a bit more about, uh, you know, so what, what kinds of data is uh, basically fed into the system? Yeah, so uh, basically we, we connect all the way from, so to kind of build a full kind of quote to cash process, as this is called now, it's gonna get very technical. Right? We basically can connect anywhere from CRM on one side, all the way to your ERP, ERP or accounting system on the other side, right? And in conjunction with that, we can connect to any, any time registration system, any kind of project management system. So if you wanna use something else in conjunction with ours, you can totally do that, right? So you can basically mix and match any any component in this, in this kind of value chain. Uh, as you like, and, and, and the added value of that is that if you look at our customers, uh, I'll say 60 to 70 percent of those that come in, they are using some sort of massive spreadsheet that you know they've built uh, typically over the years. I heard one customer actually not too long ago that had had this spreadsheet that they were using, and they've been using it now for 15 years, and it was actually you know a, a quite interesting process for them getting out of the their you know 15 year old spreadsheet that they've been using forever and ever. Um, wow, so much room for error and so much, I mean, wow, <laughs> so archaic. Uh, how they operate, right? Because most of these systems are not really well connected. I mean, you have some services, third-party services that can connect, but the difference between, you know, that and what we're building is we're building a, a, a connector to a system where we guarantee that the data consistency is there, right? Because otherwise it doesn't work. So uh, unlike other systems where they might, you know, have three retries and then drop the data, now, again, it becomes a little bit technical, uh, then you might lose actually some, some information on the way, right? So we actually guarantee that data is consistent between all systems. Uh, and that's actually needed because if you need to make decisions on the data that we provide you, it needs to be accurate, right? Because otherwise you're, you know, 
you could just as well use your spreadsheet. Um, so, so the idea here is that that strong connectors gives us the data we need, and then we have the capabilities in house to basically build, uh, not build, but provide a service where the AI automatically can you know learn from all this data that comes in. So, so a concrete example, uh, we just launched about a, I think like a month or two ago, we launched uh, an AI uh, project planner. So that's basically an AI that's fully automatically can plan out a project for you. Uh, so you basically feed it with uh, tasks. So it could be, you know, a title of a task and a description of a task and maybe some metadata around it. And then basically you click on one button and the AI will come up with the suggestion for how that project should be kind of spread out across the timeline, assigning the right people, uh, taking into account, you know, different skill sets and roles of people and all this stuff, right? Wow. Um, Impressive. So Interesting. I think that will okay. Say, Sorry, say, just to summarize. So you were saying a client uh, data, time management data, financials going into this black box and basically spitting out an ideal project plan, which the project manager then can adjust instead of starting to build one. Right. What, what stage? Anywhere from like a couple hours to multiple days a week of, of manual work. What, what, type of, uh, what type of resistance you encounter when you pitch this type of uh, solution to potential new customers? What, what are the objections that they come up with usually? So I think th actually there are really not that many objections. The, the main objection is like, is this really possible, right? Can this actually work? Um, but you know, then when they see it, it and it works, then you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a given. Uh, but but in, in addition to that, I don't really think there are any objections. You know, in the beginning, we would have a lot of, you know, maybe project managers saying, all right, are you trying to remove my work? Um, but we're not really, right, because that the, the role of a project manager, resource manager, that type of role, it's shifting anyways, right? Because they need to, you know, spend time on stuff. First of all, it's stuff they like, that's fun, which is not updating a spreadsheet for most people. I mean, I know there are some pedantics that like updating their spreadsheet, but you know, most, most people don't enjoy that. Um, and, and, you know, shifting the focus towards the team and the customers and making, you know, making the team efficient and delivering the right things and making the customer, helping them understand their business better and how they can kind of provide value to them, right? Uh, I um, think that you, you are not disclosing the revenues, but you can disclose the number of clients and the geography where they are located and the industry uh, where so they are. Uh, yeah, we have customers in, I think, 43 countries now. Um, and uh, there are, it's below a thousand, but uh, not, not too far from there. Um, and uh, I'll say probably 40-50% of our customers are in, the, in North America right now. Uh, so, so that's kind of where we have the main, main amount of business coming from, but we have it you know, all over the place. We have uh, Hong Kong, APEC, a bunch of places in APEC, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South America. So kind of very, very, you know, if you look at the map, it's, it's quite, quite spread. Uh, but I mean, that's the benefit of having a, a, an internet-based company, right, where people can just access it from anywhere. That's why I'm quite uh, interested to find out the rationale not going to Silicon Valley. Wouldn't have been a good move if you have so many customers in North America. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's definitely also on the roadmap. Uh, but we wanted to. So the reason why we haven't done so is, um, first of all, there's a high cost involved in going to Silicon Valley. Uh, so you know, ten million dollars can sound like a lot, but if you go to Silicon Valley, it's it's uh, it's not really a lot of money. Uh, to make that work from a, from hiring people perspective. Um, second of all, uh, we chose London as our kind of first international office because we wanted something that was fairly close in proximity to the, 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 the other office we have, right? So we could make sure that the commercial team that primarily sits there uh, are tightly connected to the product team um, so that we make sure that we can kind of, you know, close the loop of, you know, customer feedback with the product. Um, and then, you know, once that is a, you know, more operational, I'll say, uh, we will we'll be going to the U.S. So that's something that's going to be happening probably uh, early, mid next year. Cool. Um, so my next question for you is related to uh, clients. You sort of alluded to it um, a bit earlier. I wanted to ask essentially who is your ideal client? I, I know you said, um, you know, a, a business that's, you know, 50 people or more. Um, but in terms of uh, industry, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we have a uh, you know quite uh, broad uh, industry uh, representation in our customer base, uh, and that's you know just by the nature of you know people coming in. Uh, but but if you look at what we focus on, it's it's within the professional service space typically. 
so that can range anywhere from, I will say, agencies, um, typically on one side, right, to more kind of heavier industry like construction, engineering services, um, you know, accounting firms, uh, IT or marketing departments, and larger companies as well. Um, so, you know, quite a broad spread, but, but I think if you look at our customer base, the majority will be in the agency consulting space right now. Um, and then, you know, I'll say the third runner up is probably software development business like ourselves that has some sort of digital product they need to deliver to either to an end user or to a customer. Um, and that's kind of where the, the product really uh, lends itself well to, to work in, in those types of, of companies. Great. So in terms of affordability, whoever our audience is or whoever's listening to, just for them to, to know, um, you know, what, what is the price range like for your product? Yeah, so the pricing starts at around $300 a month per account, which is per customer, um, and, and then goes upwards from there. It's a fairly straightforward model, so you pay per seat. Uh, so basically the amount of people you have uh, that goes into the product uh, is, is, uh, is reflected in, in, in the subscription that you're paying. Uh, and then you can pay, you know, uh, on, a, on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis, on an annual or multi multi year. Uh, so that's you know quite flexible. But you know, the I don't think the the cost is the cost of the product is interesting in the sense that you know if we have some of the smaller customers, they can sometimes say, all right, this is this this seems fairly expensive. Um, and then when you when you kind of break it down for them and you explain to them the amount of money they're spending right now updating spreadsheets manually, then it like, seems like a, there's quite a, a difference in, 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 in that, right? So I think um, a lot of industries are used to getting software very cheaply, uh, which is fine, but I think to some degree, uh, the amount of internal work and process inefficiencies uh, sometimes uh, is neglected and that you know, drastically overshadows almost any, any, any type of software cost, more or less. Um, so thinking for the customers that you know we, we show good RI uh, for for most of them and it's you know it, it pays itself back uh, I'll say hundreds of times uh, in a year. Yeah, makes sense. I think this pricing is actually on par with uh, you know Trello and um, the other project management tools as well, and we especially with. Compete, Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, we also have to compete, Ryan. So uh, obviously, you know. Yeah. If we, if, we, if we produce value for like a thousand dollars for a customer, right, and, and we charge, uh, you know, a, a hundred for that, right, but uh, the rest money of, on the table, yeah, then you know, it's uh, we so we kind of have to be in, in somewhat in, in the ball game of what they what they charge. Yeah, I was actually gonna say that. I mean, it, it, it is it seems some it seems cheap when you compare it to Trello and whatnot, but because, um, you know, Forecast provides a lot more features yep. and, and the AI bit that, you know, definitely Trello doesn't have. And Trello is for a lot more, I guess, smaller kind of projects and yep. more using cards, but not so much planning out like project plans for the uh, gas or construction industry. Yeah, so I think there is a, there's a you know, if, if you don't understand, like if, if people don't, most people don't understand the space, it's a little bit abstract, right? Uh, it's, um, there's a, quite a drastic difference between task management and project management. Those are kind of two very different things, right? So we see a lot of, of customers that come to us, they have been in the task management space and are now kind of outgrown that and need something more robust that can kind of help them understand things better and, and do more kind of more advanced stuff basically, right? And that's where we come in. So, so that's also why we don't really compare ourselves to that because mostly we see people migrating upwards um, from, from the systems there. Yes, I think it will be interesting also to find out how long it takes for you to implement the solution to your client. How long is the switch between whatever they're using to being fully operational with Forecast? Yeah, so I think it, it depends a little bit. If you look from a technical perspective, it will take you less than 10 minutes. Uh, but I mean, if you look from a, a process operational perspective, uh, typically a customer um, has to understand that what they're doing now uh, probably has some change impact in their organization and how they work, right? Uh, so I'll say that that's kind of the main thing. Um, I mean, you can go to the website now, you can sign up for a trial, you can start paying and you can connect, you know, X amount of systems and you can do that within the next 30 minutes. Um, so it's more about kind of, you know, when you roll it out internally in, in your company that you have an understanding of what you're trying to achieve and how you intend people to to start using the product, right? So I think that's that's kind of the main thing. Again, you know, coming back to kind of licensing and, and what the cost of that is compared to actually rolling it out. Um, 
you know, I'll, I'll give you an example of, uh, so, so one very large customer we have, they uh, have a long rollout phase because they're rolling out uh, multiple thousands of people into the product, right? And, and that takes a while. You can't just do that in five minutes, obviously, right? Um, but if you're a small, you know, 50 man team, I'll say you could be up and running in, in like a week, uh, including, you know, your internal process around that. If, if you're kind of ready for it, right? I'd say that's the main thing. Um, so I think for, you just need to kind of understand that, you know, you can't just roll. I mean, it's like switching accounting systems, right? It, you know, probably technically not very difficult, but, you know, having people then using a new accounting system, understanding how to use it, it's probably, uh, you know, and more that, of a human, human change. And that probably implies that you guys have a post sales team to go and, and teach them how to use it or encourage them to use it more or generally something that they do. So, yeah. So, so everything is self-service. You can go on the website, you start, you know, we don't have to do anything. Uh, we don't actually go to the client site. Uh, we do everything remote. Um, so what we do is we have an onboarding team and a customer success team that helps customers, uh, learn the product, understand what they need to do to, you know, to achieve different things, whatever they're trying to achieve. Um, and that's, you know, a, you know, a process where you will typically have a few steps where you go through like introduction to this, the system and the product, and then introduction to you know, understanding what are your problems. And then basically uh, the, the, the customer success team will help our customers uh, configure the system to what they want. And then uh, basically they run from there. But we also have, uh, a bunch of customers coming in every month that never talk to us, right? They just go in and they configure it themselves and then they just, you know, start. Um, so I think it also depends a little bit on, typically I'll say it's with the size of the organization. So the bigger you are, the more kind of service you're expecting, so to say. If you're smaller, you're used to kind of these self-serve tools. So you're, you're in that sense a little bit more mature, I think, where the big ones typically want to, you know, talk to a person and, and ensure there's actually a, a person on the other side. It's not just the... Uh, some sort of weird scam. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, so I'll say implementation can vary, but you know, it, it, it's typically a function of the amount of people you need to put into a single account. That's gold. I mean, uh, basically we, when you design a product that, that people can just go in and self-service from that range of being able to do that, plus, you know, the handholding that that's required for larger companies, um, yeah, that's in, and in such a short time as well that you're able to do this, because I know a lot of software companies, they start by, you know, every client will require, you know, people in our team to and sort of educate them and, and sort of massage the system so that it fits them. Okay. Um, and then they start graduating to a level after several years of, uh, you know, now you can go online and download this and click the three buttons yeah. and you're, you're up and running. But but it's amazing you did it so fast. Um, yeah, think, from, my next question to you is, uh, go ahead, no, sorry. I was just gonna say, I mean, from the outset, we've tried to build uh, stuff in a way that we can automate it, right? So we try to kind of, we, we always, you know, we always start with a manual process on most things, right? And then as soon as we see kind of repeatability, we try to automate it and then we just, you know, go from there, right? So that's basically the, the nature of, of we operate with things here, right? So we try to, I mean, if we don't if we don't automate in a company that does automation for people, it doesn't <laughs> make any sense, right? <laughs> exactly, and that that makes sense. That's your you're putting your consultant hat on. <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. Um, okay, so uh, regarding the team, you alluded earlier that you're a fifty person team. You have a customer success team. Imagine sales development. Um, can you tell us a bit about the you know percent? breakdown of how many percent is in a customer success, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, so the funny thing is we actually don't have a sales team. <laughs> we have, uh, I have uh, two account execs that, that, you know, sit and receive orders from customers coming in online. Uh, and that's basically what we have for, for sales. Um, so we even automated that. <laughs> we haven't automated it. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, I think we've been in a fortunate position where we have been building things that people really like, which has, you know, reduced the need for heavy sales. Um, so it's not that we don't need it. We will, I mean, that's definitely part of what we're doing now is scaling uh, a more aggressive sales model where we don't just sit and wait, you know, but actually, you know, try to reach out to people. Uh, but in addition to that, we have, uh, you know, a team in the marketing that, you know, does content, does SEO, uh, does paid uh, performance marketing. Um, and then we have, uh, 
fairly large engineering team. So, I mean, to build a product like this, it's fairly complex. So we have actually four engineering teams. Uh, so that's approximately, yeah, almost 30 people out of the 50, I'll say, uh, that are in engineering. Um, so, so basically trying to really spend a lot of money and focus on building the right product. And then the theory, at least in my head, is if you build something good, then, you know, it should be easier for people to adopt it, right? Uh, I think, you know, there are two approaches to building a company. Either it's, you know, having a large sales force and just trying to kind of sell stuff and then it's building a product and then afterwards trying to sell stuff, right? So we, we, we've taken that approach instead. Um, so I, I don't think, you know, there's necessarily one way that's better than the other. It's just two different approaches. And, you know, me, myself coming from a computer science background, uh, you know, product background, I've built product for many years. It's uh, natural that I like to, you know, my, my uh, interest gravitates toward building, building product more than it does necessarily <laughs> towards building a, a big commercial organization. Perfect. Uh, Stefano, I want to bounce it back to you just in case you have any questions for Dennis. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, so correct my geography knowledge, is Denmark part of Scandinavia uh, and the Nordic region? Is it correct? And so, yeah, so we're the kind of the bottom country in the Nordic region. So the Nordic like, region. Yeah. There are a lot of uh, unicorns coming out from there. Uh, are you aiming to be one? Yes, we are for sure aiming to be one. Um, so I think I think once you take, that, that's kind of a function of taking venture capital, right? If you take venture capital and you don't have the intention of, of doing that, then you should not have taken venture capital because you know, you're know you gonna disappoint a bunch of people, right? Uh, so, so that's definitely the approach, right? And, and I think uh, we, we're on a, on a good path uh, to that, you know? Um, but I think, I think that's actually interesting from the financing perspective that you talked about, right? Is that if you are starting a business and, and running a business and you intend to take venture capital, you need to understand that if you don't have the aspiration to become a unicorn, become a market leader globally, then venture capital is probably not for you, right? Yeah, but at um, the moment you are not fundraising, and, uh, but you have uh, in the roadmap to move to the U.S. And so you need the capital to go to the U.S., but then you're not fundraising. When are you going to start uh, raising again? Probably uh, end of the year, um, but we have you know we have uh, a good amount of cash on at hand. So so right now the focus is is making sure that we uh, basically build the correct sales engine and the commercial engine. So that's that's the focus, right? And, and you know more capital right now would not necessarily speed that up. So so the way I'm thinking about uh, external financing is that. Uh, you know you you could argue you could always be fundraising, right? But I mean uh, to some degree I think. If, if extra cash in does not help you fuel faster growth, then it doesn't really make sense, right? So it's, it, then it would be kind of better to wait and then take cash at a later stage. Clear, otherwise you'll end up uh, losing focus and perhaps implementing yeah. things that are not really core to your, to your journey. Um, in, in that case, um, a question on the, on the valuation perhaps, how much is the current valuation? Have you calculated or you're not calculating because you're not raising? No, we're calculating that, but I'm not gonna disclose that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Diane, any question for you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so you, earlier we talked about uh, coronavirus and how yeah. it's not really affecting your business, kind of uh, want to hear more about that and your thoughts um, on how the outlook would be, you know, this this year, I guess, who knows when Corona virus will end. Yeah, so I think, um, I think, you know, some countries are now on the downward slope and kind of getting out of it. Uh, others are, you know, to some degree more or less starting, right? So so this is something that would probably take a while to, to get out of, uh, is, is my impression. Um, I'm in, I'm in no way a former doctor, right? So I will not say whether the approach anyone is taking is good or bad. Uh, but I think uh, from our perspective as a business, um, a lot of people uh, are now forced to work from home, right? So they're basically forcing, this thing is forcing people to work distributed, uh, which means that if you don't have processes in place to run an efficient operation, uh, it becomes very evident now uh, that, that you don't have that. And that I think that's, definitely part of why we're seeing basically no slowdown in, in uh, the amount of customers we get uh, right now. Um, because most of them realize, all right, I need, I need to do something, right? I, I mean, I might not even be geared to working from home, right? I might not even, you know, have good processes in place, which, you know, what's, what's fine when, you know, when finances are up, everything is easier, right? But I think when finances are down, 
uh, it forces you to kind of think of new processes and, and new ways of doing things. And I think that's that's a function of what we're seeing. I mean, if you look at some of these other uh, video conferencing uh, platforms, they're also kind of rocketing through the uh, the roof right now. Uh, so I think in general for everything across kind of work management, collaboration, uh, that space uh, will be a, a, a space that's that's going to be doing well, I think, for, for the next time, right? Fair enough. And I, I, as opposed to the co-working spaces, which I guess now they are struggling because co-working. That was probably too sexy to be in co-working right now. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of industries that are that are really struggling with this, right? And that's obviously unfortunate. I think there's also a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of investors who have, who have bet on some of these these uh, industry categories that are really struggling now, right? And, and, and we'll definitely see uh, a massive, you know, We'll see. We'll see a bunch of companies go out of business in not too long. I'm, I'm sure of that. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think it will definitely shift, right? And I think if you're building a core uh, product for a user, typically a business user, right, uh, that they have to use to some degree on a on a daily or weekly basis, then it's kind of difficult to disrupt that, right? Because they need it no matter what, right? Um, but I think if you're, you know, uh, doing some sort of uh, more consumer focused uh, business, then it, it becomes more difficult, right? Because their needs and, and you know, ability to, to pay for things will, will definitely shift, right? I mean, we're seeing a lot of people going out of work, right? Uh, we're seeing, you know, queues of, of unemployment just increasing uh, really, really drastically, right? And that was obviously affect mostly on, on, on the B2C side. Let's um, let's start wrapping it up. We have taken 45 minutes of your time. Perhaps we'll go to the last questions and then we will leave uh, one last minute for you to, to close it and share all the details that you want to share, like the website or whatever the message you want to give to our listeners. Um, so for me, the question will be perhaps I will say about what's your future. Um, you kind of shared about the presence in, uh, in the U.S. Um, you mentioned also they have clients in uh, Hong Kong. Since today you are in Europe, Diana is in Africa and I'm in Asia. Uh, is Asia and Africa on your geography as well? Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't say, uh, well, I, I would say Africa because we already have customers in, in South Africa, for instance. Um, but, but I'll say our focus uh, is, is busy stepwise, right? So it's Europe right now, and then it's US, and then after that, it's going to be APAC, right? Um, so th that's kind of the, the stepwise approach. Um, so we will be focusing on that uh, once we kind of have built the engine that works and then we basically scale it out, right? And more, you know, maybe some of that will be scaled in parallel, maybe some will be scaled in, in a serial, serial fashion. So that, that has to be shown. Cool. Yep, Diane, any questions uh, for you? Yeah, one last uh, cheeky question. Um, Dennis, want to know if you're uh, basically eating your own dog food. Are you guys using your own software? Yes, we are. We uh, have been using our own software since day one. Uh, I think that's, that's really key, right? Uh, you will see a lot of engineers building stuff and they think it's great and then you give it to the hands of the customers and then they have no idea how to use it, right? I think that becomes very evident when you use your own product because then if there's stuff that's annoying, then the, the engineering team will automatically fix things that they don't like because, you know, it's annoying. So I think in that sense, that's quite key to, to building something good. That's great. Any last message that you want to give us? Uh, if you want to repeat the important information or talk to our okay. audience, potential customers, what would you like to say? So um, by all means, go to forecast.app dot app um, try out our product uh, we are delivering something that you probably have never seen before uh, you know which uh, hopefully should should give appetite to to try it out um, yeah and then thank you guys for, for having me on the show I appreciate it uh, and uh, yeah that's it I think thank you for sharing as well and uh, we're looking forward to see further development with forecast thank you Diane for co-hosting and thank you Dennis for your time Dennis, okay. thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Stay safe. Thank Bye. You.